Well, welcome, welcome. How are things out in North Carolina today? Oh, it's beautiful. A little chilly, but gorgeous. James is leaf blowing. Hopefully, he'll take a break from that here for a minute. <laughs> okay. Well, I've got, I'm uh, I'm uh, everybody in the house is well. My little boy's still sleeping. My my oh. my my better half is up doing a workout. Uh, hopefully, I won't interfere with their breakfast because I'm sitting not far from the kitchen. This is a good table for me to do these at. But anyway, I, yeah, like I said, I've been up at. I was just telling people I had my little walk with the dogs. I got two dogs, so I take them for a nice walk in the morning. Usually about three four miles. Uh, and then, uh, and then I did a little walk after breakfast and I've had a, you know, a dozen eggs and bacon and some, some, uh, cheddar cheese, English cheddar cheese, which I've been liking lately. It's been really good. So you said well, English? Kelly, what's that? English cheddar yeah, cheese? Yeah, it's like coastal. I think it's English, some kind of English. It's very tasty. It tastes really good. It goes really nice in omelets. I've been finding that the cheese is a little more, less bland. It's got a little more bite to it. It's, 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 yeah. It's, it's, I like a strong cheese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Strong cheese is like a strong man. That's right. Yes, that's go. right. <laughs> hey, um, I think most people are familiar with your kind of background. Um, you know, you've been, you've been now, how long have you been the carnivore now? You've been 11 years, right? Is it 11, 11 years? years in October. Well, yeah. I just, I just crossed four years myself. So you got, awesome. got, oh. you got almost triple me, but, uh, and you're one of those crazy, silly people that doesn't eat all the liver and, in organs and I, you know, I know, I know you've been adding some of that stuff in lately. You've been playing with some, I've seen some stuff. Yeah. You've been a little bit more um, adventurous. What's been going on with that? Well, tell us about, you know, you, you have not, I, you, well, you had a, let's talk about, you've had a coronary artery calcium scan recently, yeah. 10 years yeah. in, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, it's just a matter of time. You know, Dr. Baker, your coronary artery calcium scan after three or three years of keto and two years of carnivore being zero is just a, that's, you know, that's just kind of a, an anomaly with you. It's a long game. So let's talk about that. Coronary artery calcium scan, you got some labs. You've got, well, let's talk about your health now. Okay. As you know, 11 years in versus, you know, what you know, maybe objectively, because a lot of people, they don't believe in subjective stuff. You know, it doesn't matter if you feel good, look good, feel younger, perform better. That, that's all irrelevant, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm being facetious about that, yes. but let's talk about a little bit of objective stuff. So, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, you were obviously not in a place where you are now. What was going on objectively, lab-wise, and, and contrast that with what today is going on? And you have not succumbed to scurvy or subclinical vitamin C deficiency yeah. or any of those things that surely are going to happen to people to do this over a long time. So, Yeah, I'm still waiting on all of those things. Nothing yet. Still clear. I'm like Brett here. I see Brett. I, I wake up and I do my little scurvy check. Nope. Still good. <laughs> but um, so it really started... Gosh, you know, when I was born, I was a really big baby. I was a huge toddler. I was just a big kid. And in high school, I tried to like just starve myself down. I would get one little diet microwave meal a day. And my favorite was this little chicken marsala. It was one of these little uh, lean cuisine. That was it. Mm -hmm. And I was convinced if I only ate one lean cuisine per day and I would drink a carnation instant breakfast for every morning. And that was it for weeks. Every day I would do that. And it worked. By George, I finally, for the first time in my life, I looked okay. I wasn't the fat person in my family. My dad was always kind of heavy. My mom, gorgeous, like movie star figure. And my brother, really skinny. And we were all eating at the same table. It's not like I was sneaking off. You know, they weren't buying me stashes of donuts and not him. It just really affected carbs and food, whatever we were eating, affected me differently than it did my brother. So I figured carnation instant breakfast, lean cuisine for dinner, skinny. But, you know, you can do that for a while. And I had, I have a lot of willpower when it came to like, I really wanted to be pretty. I had never felt pretty. I was just always the chubby one. And, and it was working and I was able to keep that up for a long time. But then you get you get hungry and you feel sick. And I started getting strep throat infections a lot and going to the doctor for this and that. And I didn't feel happy. I had times in high school during that time period where I literally, I wanted to die because I'm not trying to sound dramatic, but it's true. I just, it wasn't because I was hungry, but I think, you know, high school can be hard anyway, but doing it on one lean cuisine meal per day did not help. And I just, I lost my, my joy, all of it. So at some point I thought, 
I don't know if it was conscious or not, but I just started to eat again. And of course, I gained back weight. I was heavier than ever. By the end of college, I was well over 200 pounds. I had James um, and I have been married 18 years this month. We were high school sweethearts. He was with me through all of this. So he remembers, he remembers me being little, cute, and miserable for a while in high school. And then in college, blowing back up again. By the time we got married, my wedding dress was a 22, 24. The few years following marriage was honestly the happiest as far as it should have been. Things were so good. We got our first house. We had a couple little dogs. I was miserable. I hit 260 pounds and I was getting boils mostly on my legs and on my backside. Not a fun time when you're supposed to be, you know, newly wet and happy, but I was going to the doctor and getting these places lanced and drained and packed, and it was awful. And the doctor finally said, look, I'm going to tell you, he was old school. He was old and old school. <laughs> he said, I'm going to keep doing this until one of us dies. And I, I just cried. I said, what should I do? And he said, you need to lose at least a hundred pounds. And then I cried harder and I didn't know how. And he said, honey, it's the carbs. It's the carbs. Now, this was 15 years ago. So at that point, I cut, he explained to me, first of all, what a carbohydrate was. I cut way back on carbs. For five years, I did really low carb and kept cutting back more and more and more. Basically, I was eating meat. Well, <laughs> I did a Google search. Is it safe to just eat meat? Because that's how I was finding I felt good. And that's when I found there's, oh, there's a carnivore community. This is a thing. And I found my people. And that's been my home ever since. The first carnivore that I found was Charles Washington. And he's like, yes, it's a thing, baby. He had already been thriving for a couple of years by that point. And, and I still keep in touch with those same people. So that's where I was then. Also, um, I had stopped having a cycle or a period for two years. And I really wanted kids. So I was feeling... By the, by the time I found carnivore, I was, or by the time I realized it was an actual thing, I was pretty much already there. I had just cut back so far on carbs for those five years. And I was looking good, but I was not adding much fat. I was trying to do it really lean. So they helped me to fix that. All right. So now here we are 11 years after that. And I have a regular cycle. I've got three babies. I My blood work is great. My CAC score, you said, was zero. I, inflammation levels stay at 0 0.5. The highest I've seen it since going carnivore is 0 0.7. Um, insulin, I just recently had a fasting insulin test done, and it was 2.8, which from what I hear, that's, I mean, it's great. I, I feel good. I, I didn't really need all of those tests to tell me that. I haven't had a single boil since I started this. And my mood is great. I can eat, uh, you know, screw lean cuisine. <laughs> I eat tons of meat and fat and I'm full and I can just live a happy fueled life without having to stress about trying to be skinny. It's like switching a car that was always meant to be diesel to finally putting diesel in it and to stop blaming the car. I, that's how I feel. Like I can finally stop blaming myself. Now, as for this organ meat thing, all right, 11 years. Well, 10 years and 11 months, technically. I did not eat organs. I had always been taught by the zeroing in on health Charles Washington crew. He's like, yeah, I hate them. You know, if you want to eat them, eat them. It's an animal. And if you don't, don't. So that had been my story. I was sticking to it. But after being asked, as I'm sure you are, Dr. Baker, probably weekly at least. Do, don't you want to eat organ meats? You're going to feel so much better. It's so good for you. I thought, okay, I will try the organ meats. So I gave it a solid month. Various organs, mostly, I mean, let's be honest, the ones that I can get mostly chicken liver, beef liver, heart, and I also added in some more fish, fish roe. I just basically tried to expand my horizons to see if I suddenly reached like next level euphoria. And I, I didn't. It was tasty and it's all carnivore and it's fine, but I pushed my body. So at first those things tasted good. I enjoyed it. And then I stopped enjoying it 
quite as much, but I forced it because it's the month of organs. This is what we're doing, body. We're doing this. So I kept eating it. And that's crap. I'm here to tell you, if your body is telling you this is not good, especially if you're not addicted to something, you know, if you're addicted to donuts and your body is screaming for donuts, you cannot listen to that voice. Do not trust your body. It's addicted. But when you're off of all that and your body is telling you, uh-uh, stop, I should have listened. By the end of the month, it's like uh, my eyes were itching, my throat was scratchy, I felt like I'd had a cold that was just getting worse and worse and worse each week. I was going to do it longer than a month, but I had to, I just quit. And as soon as I stopped, I felt like myself. So I talked to Amber O'Hearn about it. She said, yeah, you can definitely overdo it on anything. <laughs> You're overdoing this. So I've cut back. That said, I do not think everyone would feel that way eating organs. Clearly, some people thrive. I think I would have been fine if I had just done it like a normal person and had some liver once a week. But, you know, that's not really how I roll, Dr. Baker. I, if it can be overdone, I'm going to overdo it. And I did. And so lesson learned. I still say, listen to your body. If you're craving liver, go get yourself some liver. And then if you taste it and your body says, whoa, girl, stop eating liver. So that's what I'm going to do. When it sounds good to me, I'm going to buy some. And when it doesn't, I'm not. But for 11 years, I didn't. And I had all of that blood work done before I started this organ thing, which has only been the past several weeks. And everything was fine. I had no deficiencies at all. I do not. I know for sure it is not required for every single carnivore to thrive. You do not have to go hunt out every single piece of that cow, nose to tail. Plus, I eat a lot of burger patties. Who knows what's all in there already, right? There could be plenty of nose to tail in those burger patties. <laughs> but yeah, that's what's up with the organ thing. I, I hope I answered most of that. <laughs> You did. Let me, Kelly, let me give you a second. My, my, my alarm from my phone that tells me to stop the YouTube live stream is going off. And it's, okay. I got to walk over there and get it. Give me just, just one second. I'll be right yes, back. Sir. I'm clicking through the pages of people. I can only see one page of y'all at a time, but let me click through and see who all is on here. I do see a lot of names and faces that I recognize, which is so cool. Oh, I see Linda, the Carnitarian. All right, so I got that alarm off. Now I'm going to turn off the YouTube. Yeah, sorry guys, YouTube. We got 15 minutes or so. YouTube, if you want the whole deal, come on over to Meet Our X, and you guys can uh, check out the whole thing. Um, yeah, I'm the same with organ meats. You know, I've tried them and I've tried them. You know, every time they've been they've been offered to me, and I'm at a place, I'll try them and eat them. And I did a period of time where I would do liver, like like liverwurst or Braunschweiger sauce, where sauce uh, sausage and. I've had just about everything out there: sweetbreads, liver, uh, kidney. Uh, you know, uh, brain, uh, uh, intestines, testicles. I've even had testicles. And yeah. I've, I've never once noted any improvement or betterness. And, I, and honestly, I just don't like them. I don't, they, just, they just don't do it for me. Hey, I got to ask you, can you plug your, your, your vest in? Let thing light up. I'm, just, I'm fascinated with people. <laughs> yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's just some Christmas lights from the Dollar Tree. I basically um, wear them every year for an entire month of Christmas. I'm a teacher, my students love them and I just feel super festive. It's my favorite type of necklace actually. I'm very, very bougie, very, very bougie that way. Very nice, <laughs> awesome. Um, so let me ask you, um, so you've been, you know, well, this is something that, you know, there was a period of time when you first went carnival where you actually gained weight. You got, you yeah. put on body fat and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that will last for, I think, oh, I don't even think six months or so. And, and yep. a lot of people get discouraged by that. and. Uh, what was going on? What do you think happened? Do you, do you think there was an appetite regulation issue? Do you think it changed over time? Was it, was it, what was going on with that situation to your knowledge? Yeah. So I think there were at least two things at play. I think for one, I had during that five years of cutting back more and more and more to on the low carb until I was carnivore, but not really doing it right. I was definitely restricting calories during that time. And I was an exercise fanatic, but it was all cardio. I did one full hour of cardio every morning and a full hour of cardio every evening. I was just so focused, obsessed on the scale. So I knew cut out carbs, but I didn't know much else. I didn't know the importance of fat. Keto, I mean, this was 15 years ago. I didn't know. And I didn't do much reading. I was just trying a lot of this on my own. So I know I stressed my body out badly. 
like I said, two years, no cycle at all. And I wasn't even worried about it for a long time because I was looking skinny. That's all I was focused on at that point. Um, so I know that part of it is that I was, my body needed nutrition. I had been very cruel to my body during that time. And I think that when women do or men do that to themselves and then they really start eating a proper diet, they're eating all of the meats and fats. I think your body kind of hoards it for a little while. I was starving during that first six months. I could not get enough meat and fat. I ate... I was about the same weight, honestly, as I am now. I, I did gain about 20 pounds, but you know, with uh, 140 to 160 in that range, I was eating three to four pounds of meat per day, lots and lots of fat. And I just, I couldn't stop eating. And so for six months, I just ate. And the people at um, the other carnivores, the longtime carnivores were encouraging it. They said, yes, Honey, you're hungry. You haven't really eaten well in your whole life. Eat. And I said, but I gained another pound today. They said, yes, you probably need to. I say, well, I'm not underweight. I wasn't. I was about the same weight. They said, no, you are malnourished. That may not show up on a scale. You are malnourished. Eat. So I did and I fussed and I complained to them for six months. I was just so sure that this wasn't going to work. And at the end of six months, it's not like clockwork, but at about the six month point, I suddenly was like, you know what? I only ate a couple pounds today. And that was not forced. I didn't cut back. They were very adamant. This is a process. We've seen it many times. You really have to eat. Your body will let you know when you've had enough, you can relax. And it did. Two pounds was suddenly like, oh, that it's enough. And the weight that 20 pounds came off very quickly. It only took about six to eight weeks to come off. And people have said, well, yeah, obviously, because you started eating less, but I definitely think it's more complicated than that. I do not think it would have worked the same way if at the one month point I had said, okay, now I'm going to only eat two pounds of meat because that would not have, I think that would have been skipping a really important step, which is nourish your body, let it finally get what it needs. Then the appetite could relax a little bit. Things had healed. My cycle came back at about that same point. I will say that very shortly after that, I was pregnant for the first time. <laughs> so the weight did come back, but then for good reasons. Um, and then it came back off again. I got pregnant again. There was a lot of up and down during that five years because I had a few babies. But in general, I've never had to worry about my weight since then because I just think it was an important step. Um, some of you are familiar with steak and butter gal, Bella. She, she had to go through the same thing. I know she's been on your channel, Dr. Baker. And she also was ravenous for several months. She ate, she ate, and she ate. She gained some body fat even. It's not people so, well, yeah, but you just gained muscle. No, it wasn't. I wasn't, I wasn't obese. We're talking 20 pounds. But I did gain a little bit. I just think my body needed to do that in order to regulate appetite signals. I think part of it too is just finally, I mean, you, you take any child that's been starved and they end up having like hoarding issues with food, right? I think part of it was a little bit mental where I had gone so long without allowing myself to eat that when someone finally said, we give you permission, just eat. It was like, okay, let's do this. And it just, the fat tasted so good. The meat tasted amazing. And I was just sort of, I think, having a bounce back from that. Yeah, it's, I kind of, I mean, you know, when I started looking at you guys, you know, five years ago, because I was kind of, kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, vicariously looking at the zero name health crew for about a year before I decided to take the plunge and, and do it kind of you know, in a serious manner. And it was kind of, uh, you know, the, the mantra was, you know, just, just eat, eat to satiety and, yeah. you know, stick with meat and you don't have to do this and that, and you don't have to do all this fancy, complicated stuff. And it's very simplistic. And I love that message. And I think that's something that attracts a lot of people. And it's become, as this sort of carnivore community has grown, there's been a lot of sort of different takes and versions and some people that, that 
often make it very complicated. And, and, you know, we see the people that you know, you've got to eat, it's got to be raw or it's got to be, you know, X percentage of these foods that you might not like, you know, particularly organ meats and stuff like that. And, you know, they've got the people that have done this the longest that have had the most experience have said, look, it doesn't have to be that hard. And I think when I wrote my book, I tried to present it, you know, basically that way. And I th hopefully that, that, that message gets out there. Cause I think that is, the beauty of this whole thing. And, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, the, yeah, there's a few people that will do things a little differently, you know, back to the organ meat thing. You know, I, I was able, I was fortunate to do to survey 12,000 people on this diet and, you know, people are doing it to some extent. And we only found about 15% of the people were eating organ meats with any regular basis. And then by, by regular, I would say, uh, once a week was cut off. So do you eat organ meats more than once a week or once a week or more? And only 15% of the people said yes. The other 85% were very infrequently or never. So, and the result, and when we looked at the results is how many people came off meds and got better, no real difference there. So, I mean, I think it's something that I, I, I and I've said the same thing. If you want to do it and it helps, great, do it. But when those people out there saying you got to do it to be optimal and, and that stuff, I, I really push back on that. I think that's not what the, the human results have been thus far. So uh, even though it's a nice story and you can tell about how the ancestors and the indigenous tribes do this and they prize this and that, but that's not what's actually working day to day. So I think it's inter interesting. Um, and then I talk about, uh, you know, do we have to have grass finished beef? And you, I mean, you, you know, I'll sometimes pull up and in and out and throw, throw, throw a bunch of patties on my plate and a small percentage of people will sit there and say, Oh my God, how dare you? It's awful. How do you eat that poison? And, you know, I just, I just, I just kind of shake my head, you know, and I, I think even in the book, I said, Hey, you can go to McDonald's and basically improve your health drastically. And I think that's, that's important. It's not that we shouldn't, uh, you, you know, um, support regenerative agriculture and, and, and sustainability and all those things. And we do, and tomorrow, interesting tomorrow for you guys, it'll be here. Uh, Stefan Von Belay is one of the few researchers on the planet that's actually looking at meat quality and dairy quality and those types of things and how it actually affects human health. And we'll see what his, his inform data has been so far. There's not been much data on that stuff, you know? And so, uh, that's interesting. Um, you know, so you've been doing it for 11 years. So I guess Charles and Charles is up to like 13 years now or something like yeah. that. Dana and those guys are, they've been doing it for, and you know, of course you've got, uh, you know, the Andersons now probably, I think they're like 21, 22 years into it. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, this is some of the examples which are very important to to have out there for the other people that are thinking, is this sustainable? And I, you know, for those that choose to do it lifestyle-wise, I mean, this is not something you're forced to do. It's nobody's like holding you down and saying, you can't have this or that. Um, have you ever said, hey, I'm going to just have a piece of fruit once in a while? Or is there anything that that you've experimented with? Because not everybody wants to do this 100%. Some people are fine with 90%. Has that been something you've ever played with or thought about? Or what's your thoughts on that? It wasn't, I've never played with it. However, when I was pregnant with my first child, with Julia, um, I had some pickles because it was like, I, I wanted them so, so badly when I was pregnant with her. And, you know, I know you've never been pregnant, Dr. Baker, but you've been around some people, I bet, with pregnancy cravings. It is real. And I wanted a pickle. So I had a pickle and I was like, dang, that was good. And I didn't feel any negative effect from the pickle. So I thought, all right, so maybe carnivore, but pickles while I'm pregnant. So I had some more pickles and then they, they pretty quickly lost their appeal. It's like my body was like, okay, cool. You've had your pickles. So I went straight back to only meat and I didn't have any real negative effects. It just, I suddenly wasn't craving them. So I don't know if it was just the vinegar I was wanting. I don't know. I don't know why I wanted pickles, uh, it, but it, it was a thing. But with my third pregnancy, I started craving peanuts. So I had some nuts. That did not go well. I got very itchy in some awkward places. I did not feel good. And I very, my body was like, I've never been allergic to peanuts. I used to eat them when I was low carb all the time. But my body was not okay with this. And so that was a very quick venture with the peanuts. Other than those two things, I haven't experimented. I just haven't, I haven't wanted to. I'm not going to say nothing has ever looked good. I have kids. They've got food around. I'll sometimes catch a whiff of their fruit and think that smells nice. I like fruity smells. I enjoy Bath and Body Works. It's good. But I haven't, I haven't actually put it in my mouth. No. It just hasn't, 
I haven't wanted to enough to actually eat it. But yeah, the pickles and the peanuts. I tried mixed mixed effects there. And I could. My mom, she used to say all the time, you could eat a piece of fruit. It wouldn't kill you. And I would say, well, it wouldn't kill me. I could eat a cookie and it wouldn't kill me. But I'm going to guess that it would make me want another cookie. And I'm betting that if I ate some fruit, I would probably want more fruit. And I do know myself. And it's very hard for me to stop with one of anything. So it just wouldn't be worth experimenting because I don't think I could handle it. And I don't really want it. I would rather have bacon, frankly. Yeah, and I'm I'm just guessing probably those cravings were, were they first trimester. It seems to be yes. to yeah. It seems to be that first trimester is is when these cravings seem to come in for those women that do do a carnivore pregnancy. So it's interesting what's going on physio and, and pickles are kind of that classic pregnancy craving thing. Yes, I personally couldn't stand. I, I never could stand pickles. I hated them when I used to. Huh. But I would go when I was a kid. I remember we go to a hamburger place and they put pickles on there and I and I get it and I was like I, I just it was the grossest yeah. thing in the world to me. So or, or one of that that and uh, gosh bell peppers bell peppers are just uh, anyway, I never yeah. like vegetables. I'm not, I was never a vegetableitarian. I guess. Let me ask you, your school teacher. Um, many teachers, sort of, you know, they have pizza parties, cookies and cakes, cupcakes. Sometimes yeah. they'll give out rewards for kids getting the answers right, give them a little piece of candy. Yeah. Um, is that something that you see in your school, and is that something that occurs in your classroom? And how do you how do you manage your classroom? Yeah, so I am a music teacher, so thankfully I don't have to do a lot of hardcore classroom management because most kids like music. I mean, I know it's a generalization, but I can say after 20 years, most kids enjoy music and I don't have to make them do a lot of things that they hate. So I don't feel like I have to do a lot of rewarding. It kind of is rewarding for them. They just enjoy it. That said, I have children who go to my school. My own kids go there. And I just got a message this week from one of my children's teachers who I love not that she's watching at all but I do love her and she said parents we could really use some and she listed every candy that you've heard of we would love bags of this candy that candy I was like oh my gosh so in years past in this year when kids in the class get a question right the teacher in their rooms literally has walked around and passes out mini marshmallows as the kids get them right passes out skittles to the kids that get them right and to me it feels so pavlovian like <laughs> come on they don't need a treat to answer a question right just tell them good job so the teachers have said i feel so bad for them because they can't have a marshmallow what do you want me to give them and i was like well just tell them good job and if you really want to hand them something you could Give them a sticker or, you know, a raisin, I guess, if you feel like you have to hand them food. I don't know. But it is hard to send your kids into a situation knowing that the entire day it's about if y'all are good, I'll give you a dum-dum. If you're good, this. And it's maddening. That's what it is. It's maddening. So, no, I don't pass it out, but I see it all the time. Kids will say at the end of class, I'll say, man, y'all are so good today. And they'll go, can we have candy? Do I ever give you candy? No. <laughs> but that's what they've they've come to expect. Do I get candy? It's a sad state, really. Little addicts, but um it doesn't it doesn't have to be that way. Obviously, kids who are not addicted are perfectly fine with some praise or a little pat on the back. Can you uh, would would your school allow you to hand out a piece of bacon if for, for something right would that be is there is there some sort of policy where you can't have x amount of fat or <sighs> what would happen if you did that do you think well, right, you're, right at, our policy is that you cannot give out anything homemade so if it was a homemade cupcake it is not allowed if it is store bought in the plastic container then it is allowed so perhaps if i went and bought like pre-cooked bacon I could probably pass it out, but there's no, um, there's not like a macro rule. Sadly, in our cafeteria, you will not find bacon or eggs. It is prepackaged cereal bars for breakfast um, or cereal. They have to have a fruit. They have to have a milk or juice. And they have to have their entree, which is a prepackaged carbohydrate. That's what, that's breakfast. So... How long, have you, how long have you been teaching now, Kelly? This is my 20th school year. Have you seen a, a change in the 
kids sort of attention span behavior over the last 20 years or is it, or is it, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, maybe if you went back farther, I mean, when I was a kid and this is a while ago, I mean, I early seventies was when I was, you know, kind of grade school ish. Um, I don't remember having snack time. I remember walking around with a Scooby-Doo lunchbox or something like that with, you know, that, that, that probably didn't clean enough because it smelled pretty bad, but, <laughs> um, but that was my food and I didn't have, you know, various snacks throughout the day. And then when I got home at, whatever, 3.30 when I walked home from school because you used to walk home from school and I'd get home and I'd be hungry and my, I'd say, mom, I'm hungry. She didn't hand me a, a, a you know, granola bar. She said, wait till dinner. You right. know, you, you, you did dinners in two hours, wait, and you didn't spoil yeah. your appetite for dinner. And now that's obviously how dare the kids go hungry for more than three minutes. So, I mean, have you seen any changes that have either gone good or bad uh, in, in the last 20 years since you started? Um. I can see a much bigger difference. I attended the same school, by the way. I went to the school kindergarten through eighth grade as a child. And now I have taught there 20 years. So I have a lot of experience in this one building. I can see a very big difference from the time that I attended to now. It is very hard for me to compare the first year of my teaching until now. And for totally not diet related reasons, the school lines changed. It's a very different school. It was an incredibly rough group of kids when I first started teaching there and now it's a totally different clientele so it's a hard comparison but I'll completely agree with what you're saying I see it all the time it's constant snacks they have that sugary breakfast and then my kids snack time is scheduled like an hour after breakfast I see it on their schedule and I'm like why do you need a snack then and then lunch is at 11 and then sometimes they'll have a little post. The teacher will give a snack out after lunch. Then they're back in my hands by 2.30. And I'll hear kids outside saying, I'm so hungry. I'm like, all you've done is eat all day. <laughs> That's all you've done. And so I do see that as being very different from when I went to school. Um, yeah, my kids eat really. I'm, I keep looking over this way because I'm watching them swing outside my window right now. But they eat very high fat, animal based. You can't eat a big meal like that and then keep packing in snacks. It just, you, your body doesn't want it. So there's plenty of times where they will say to me, in fact, just a little bit ago before I came down here, I said, guys, I've got to be downstairs at 12. So we need to go ahead and have lunch. And they said, we're not hungry. And they'll just say, we're not hungry. You, you don't hear that a lot with carb eaters because when it's carbs, you can always eat. I know, but when it's animal foods and you get truly full, they aren't asking for snacks all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I had, I literally had a dozen eggs and, and eight pieces of bacon and, you know, whatever, a bunch of cheese just a little bit ago, probably, what is it, uh, 9.30 here, so probably an hour and a half ago. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, I'll probably eat again. I'll eat a couple of steaks, you know, probably around 2 p.m. or something like that. It'll yeah. be my next meal. But, I mean, truth be told, if I wanted to, I could easily go up there and, and there's, there's carbs in the house. My the rest of the family has some, so I could go eat some, whatever, some carbohydrate based food and I would yeah. eat it and I'd want some more and I could keep eating that right now, even though I'm, yeah. I don't need to, or don't desire to, but I do think there's people that, you know, they'll eat for non hunger reasons. And I think that's where people tend to get into trouble with this. And this sort of gives you that physiologic, I'm not really hungry. You just have to work on the mental discipline to say, I'm not hungry. Therefore I'm not going to eat rather than, I'm yeah. bored and that looks good. I'm going to eat it anyway, even though I'm not hungry. And I think that's still something people struggle with from time to time. Have you seen some, some children that have gotten more, has there been a higher prevalence in obesity in your school? That is an absolute yes. Yes. We have kindergartners this year, type two diabetics. I had a kindergartner. She's now a third grader in kindergarten and she had never failed. She was a six year old kindergartner, 199 pounds. Yes. She, and it is, she can barely get up and down the steps. It is pitiful that I have 100% seen an increase in children where as soon as they walk in, you just hurt for them where it, it, it looks and feels very abusive, honestly, because you know, they're not shopping for themselves. They're six and you just want to get them help somehow. Yes. Yeah. And I guess you're, you, that's like, you know, you, you go through the, you know, I mean, we all see it, you know, you go to the grocery store and you, 
you see the person in front of you and they're obese and they've got three little kids that are all yeah. on their way or already some of them are obese and you look in the shopping cart and it's filled with just, I mean, there's really no nutrition in the shopping cart. I mean, there might be an egg and there might be a pack of chicken and then it's like sodas and potato yeah. chips and, you know, and some fruit because the fruit is healthy and, you know, and you just see it on and on and you just want to, you know, I, I'm sure as a parent, as a teacher, you just want to take these kids and their parents say, hey, look, just do this, you know, it would, it would, yeah. but I mean, you know, it's, it's tough to, to be in that situation and, and yeah. you know, know that you probably, if I'm, I'm guessing if you probably did that, you probably would be complained about or something like that. Is that, is that fair to say? I would think that's fair to say. Now I do work with another teacher who is a carnivore, um, total carnivore that we've been friends for a few years now. And she is a homeroom teacher. So that's the difference for me. I have several hundred students that come to me. It's much harder to, you know, step in and, and have those conversations because I'm not as close with the parents. I, I just have a lot of kids. And she has a homeroom. And she actually taught the, the six-year-old that was 199 pounds. And the teacher reached out to her and said, I need help. I don't know what to do. And so she said, well, I can tell you what helped me. She had, she had lost a hundred pounds herself, this teacher. And so she did try to pass that on. Um, but the parents were um, incredibly very low income and very obese themselves. And I think they tried for a little while and I thought I was seeing improvement. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how that's going because where I teach students can either be 100% in school or 100% virtual. And she is 100% virtual this year. So I'm, I'm a little bit afraid when I see her next. I think things were going a little better, but you know, quarantine has not always made that things like that go better. I hope to heavens that they took her words to heart and it's been a great several months, but I do worry. I haven't seen her in a while, but yes. Um, if I were to just reach out, I think Food and religion are a little bit similar in this way. If I were to just start announcing to my classes my religious beliefs and my dietary beliefs, I don't think either of those things would go over well with my boss. But if a parent were to ask me, where do you go to church? I am allowed to say. And I have a car. My car out in the parking lot says, eat the meat, save the humans, and a sticker that's about this big on it. And so I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to wear a shirt that says eat the meat, save the humans. I'm allowed to have a van that says it. And if I am asked, I'm allowed to give my opinion on religion, on food, on anything. So I don't feel like I have no rights at all, but I do have to be kind of careful that I'm not teaching something as my curriculum if I'm not asked. Yeah, let me ask you, and, and this is something, you know, well, I guess, you know, you've always been fairly vocal. I mean, you, you know, you had a blog, uh, you know, that, 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 that saw a lot of people, you, you've been on some magazines. And so among, cause you know, in this original zeroing in health group, it's, it was kind of an insular community where they didn't really have an interest in sort of broadcasting this. I'll take if people want to come in there and they'll help them, but there wasn't really interested in, in, in you know, kidding. And, and I, you know, I saw it and I said, this is pretty damn helpful. I think a lot of people should know about this. So I, could, I became a little more vocal about it. You know, I got obviously got a lot of criticism about that. But recently, you've really, I think you stepped up the game. You know, you got the shirts, you got the YouTube channel, you're really just what, what, what prompted that? What was it? What was the turning? But why did you say, hey, I'm really going to get out there and get in your face and really push the limit on this stuff? What's 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 going going on? Well, this is kind of uh, me putting myself out there part two. So I did this several years ago. Uh, that's when I did like, daily mail and good housekeeping and up in the blog and I thought all right I'm gonna tell I feel so good I'm gonna tell the world and I went at it so sweet and innocent and the world was not ready for this at all I I I was lamb blasted a lot um it it was not fun and I I put up with it for a little while and then it became almost scary and it made me sick to open my email you know, people saying you should be ashamed of yourself. You're so irresponsible telling people to eat this way. When you start hearing of people dying of heart attacks, you'll wish you hadn't said this. You can only get so much mail like that before it gets to you. And it did. So I went back to my little Facebook world. I never stopped trying to help. But I decided at that point, I'm just going to help the people who want help. And I think that's what zeroing in on health people have always felt like. 
you know, it's here. And if people want help, they're ready for it. And if they're not ready for it, they're not ready that you can't force a water to horse to drink, something like that. And so they didn't push it. So I tried pushing it up once with the blog and everything. And I left it up the whole time. It was always there. But my thing at that point was, look, I put it all out there. And now I'm going back to my Facebook group and I'm just going to hang out there for a while. And then in the past, it was really just the beginning of 2020. It was January 1st or 2nd. And I was just um, getting myself ready. And I had the thought, it would be really fun to make videos. I make videos for school all the time. Puppet shows. <laughs> I make these music theory puppet shows and have for years. I just love it. My kids are the puppeteers and I, I teach the puppets. And I thought, man, I should do it about something else I'm really crazy about. I should make a meat show. And I said it to James that day and he was like, a meat show. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> So just this year, I decided I would try doing videos and it was fun. And I had myself a t-shirt made just for the people that were on the show. So I sent one to you and to the other guests who had been on the show, um, Brett and Dr. Barry. And I said, hey, thanks for coming on the show. I just made some shirts. And then people started asking, hey, where did you get that shirt? And I was like, Oh, well, I mean, I could make more. So I didn't really start off thinking I'm going to sell t-shirts. And in fact, I've only done it for very brief amounts of time. Like, hey, this weekend, I'm going to sell shirts. And I also um, thought it would be a cool way to raise some money, several hundred dollars for the clinical trials, which I saw today. We bumped right over 145000 That's exciting. Um, I don't know. I think I've always been vocal. It's just more the areas. I think people are more ready to listen right now. I haven't gotten bl land blasted this time. I put a video out and I don't get hate mail. It's, it's pretty dreamy actually. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think at, at this point, you know, there's enough people out there that are, that are out in the open doing this, that, you know, you're not the one, the one lone John the Baptist, you know, getting, getting, getting beat down, you know? And, and yeah. like I said, I, you know, and I took some of that stuff, you know, and I got a lot of hate, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of one of those guys that I'm, I got thick skin. And I'm like, unlike you, I'm willing to tell somebody to go F off, you know? <laughs> I just, yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm willing to do that because I, I, I don't put up with that stuff. But I mean, I can see where, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you can take it to heart and, you know, you yeah. just kind of, you're trying to do your best. You're, because you're, we're out here trying to help people. I mean, yeah. that's what we're truly trying to do. And, you know, you get people that just want to denigrate you and they just want to bring you down and they just, you know, it's, it's just it, because, you, you know, well, we see if, if you, if your whatever doesn't match my beliefs and you are therefore a bad, evil person. And, you know, that's, 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 uh, you know, that's just the kind of way it's, it's become, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you know, and like I said, and I, and I've, and, and I want to thank you. I've got several of your shirts right now and I wear them pretty frequently, you know, it's kind of, yes, I you. will tell you, I know you sent me a, cause you got a, you got a hoodie. Yeah. And I, I rarely wear bulky, warm clothes because I'm, I'm just always hot. It seems like, and I'm always working out, but my girlfriend has copped to that, copped that. And she loves it. So anyway, she, and she's, oh, about, she's, I like that. she's okay. about 90% carnivore. I mean, she, awesome. she, she eats basically. And she started out vegetarian when I met her eight years ago and she was just kind of a recovering vegetarian with all kinds of digestive issues. It got wow. better. And we did the whole paleo to low carb to keto to, to carnivore journey together. And she's been about three years behind me. I remember the first time she took a bite of hamburger meat, you know, it was like, yeah. it was like a big thing for her. And now she's eating steaks, but she oh. still won't eat them. If they're, if they're, if they're, if there's any red at all, she just won't do it. Mm -hmm. she's, still, she's still doing the, the well done stuff, which pains me a little bit, but anyway, to each their own. Um, speaking of which, so let's talk a little bit, you know, outside of your little recent experiment, uh, meat cookies. I mean, your diet has been I mean, mostly ground beef hamburgers, right? What do you, what's a, what's a typical week for Kelly Hogan look like from the, from the nutrition front? What would be a, what would be a typical week's worth of food? Yeah. So on Sundays, that's my most out there kind of day. I'll, I'll typically have some scrambled eggs with the family on Sundays and then Sunday nights, every, pretty much every Sunday night, we go to my father-in-law's house. He has a Traeger smoker. He smoked meats. Oh my gosh, they're so good. And he does a wide variety. He does a lot of pork, chicken, beef, and whatever he serves, he knows he doesn't put any sweetness on it at all. No sauces. He'll use some seasoning, but he knows me by now. We've been going over there my entire marriage. Um, and so that's 
Sunday and I'll usually have just a couple of burger patties for lunch to get me through till I go to his house for dinner. But every other day of the week, for the most part, I eat, I don't get, I don't eat breakfast because I'm just not hungry in the mornings. And I'll eat four burger patties for lunch. That's one pound of meat. Um, if I am wanting butter, I'll take butter with me a lot of times. I'm on a butter kick right now, Dr. Baker. <laughs> I've used bacon fat for many years. I love bacon fat on a meat cookie. I call my burger patties meat cookies because I just typically pick them up and eat them like you would a cookie. I love bacon fat on there when I'm craving fat, but I've just recently started putting butter on them. Oh my gosh, it's so good. So if I do add a lot of butter, I normally won't eat the fourth one. I just find that three fills me up. But some days I don't want any butter, so I'll eat all four. And then I go home, and for dinner, when my kids are eating, some days I'm not hungry, so I'll just sit with them and talk, and I like to crochet. Crochet has become one of these things where if I am with people who are eating, but I am not eating, for me mentally, that was kind of a hard thing. I felt awkward. I felt like I made other people feel awkward. If I was at a friend's gathering and everyone was eating and I was the one sitting there without food and or without alcohol or without something, I don't know that I actually made them feel weird, but in my mind, I did. And so now I've just become the chick that shows up with yarn. <laughs> so either I'll bring burger patties and I'll sit and eat those, or if I'm not hungry, because I'm not always hungry, like a lot of folks who do eat carbs, I will just pull out my yarn and some seltzer water and just talk and crochet. It's like I'm doing something that fulfills instead of this. So I'll sit at the dinner table and I just crochet homely looking scarves, which I have started shipping off to people who ask me for them. Because <laughs> I don't actually wear a lot of scarves. I just send them to people. It's just something to do. Oh, I don't even remember what the question was now, but um, what do I eat? Yes. So then when I do get hungry, I'll typically for dinner eat two to four more burger patties or a steak. So we do, we had a Weber grill and I've got a cinder grill and I've got an auto wild and I'm getting pretty good at using all of these things. So I'll throw either London broil or chuck eye. We do a lot of those too. I love a London broil cooked really rare with butter on top because it is so lean. I've got to add fat to it. Or a chuck eye, which is very similar to a ribeye. I, I would buy ribeyes every single day, but my kids have massive appetites for an actual meal. They don't snack all day, but when they eat, they eat. That four-year-old can easily put away a pound of ribeye. And if I bought ribeyes for the five of us every day, well, I would need, uh, I would need to make a lot more videos. So, <laughs> um, so chuck out to me tastes very similar, but is much cheaper around here. Um, and so then I'll either have a half pound to a pound of burger patties or a half pound to a pound of steak. And that's how most every day goes, except for Sundays. What, so, I mean, obviously, um, you know, 2020 has been a difficult year for everybody yeah. with, with this, you know, coronavirus pandemic, you know, I'm sure your school, your life as a teacher, I mean, because as a parent, you know, I've got four children, we're, we're in the process of adopting a fifth. And oh, um, yeah, so I'll be, I'm looking forward to being, uh, holding a little baby when I'm 54 years old, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how I hold up, but, That's um, so cool. but you know, you know, it's like I've got one one kid. Like well, and my my oldest daughter is actually into crocheting right now, which is kind of funny. She says she's doing that. I kind of laughed. I said you sound like an old grandma, but yes, it's kind of, it's kind of cute. But um, you know, why would the my, and, and three of them are with my ex wife, and they don't live with me full time. But I, you know, uh, I'm going, actually they're coming out for Christmas, which would be really really oh. nice to have them. But my little one is in a, is in a is in a uh, bilingual French school. His mom's from France, and so she wanted to make sure he retained. French skills, but you know, he just, you know, he was in school for a while and they just closed the school again. You know, there's one kid that, that, that was exposed to somebody else that tested positive for coronavirus. And so they shut the whole school down again. So it's just, and then they just said, you know, if you travel outside of the state of California, you will have to go into quarantine for two weeks when you get back, which I'm just like, what happens at the state line? And California is a big state. I could run, I could drive to the, the border of Arizona quicker than I can get to Northern California and travel more distance, but right. it's some arbitrary, not, you know, I think it's a little bit of nonsense, but how is that as a teacher? How is that affected? I know you had some concerns initially about, you know, being exposed to these kids and what's going on with that? 
Well, you know, initially, I don't know about you, but when, let's say back in March, you know, we're all scrubbing our groceries down when we came in the house. Like, you know, initially, yeah, I think we all had, um, I shouldn't say everybody, but I think we probably back in March may have felt differently than we do right at this moment, one way or the other. Uh, maybe I'm just projecting, but when I, so when I first went back to school, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I was in charge of taking temperatures for the entire staff. And one of the reasons I was chosen was because I did not have any of the, I wasn't obese or asthmatic or diabetic. And my principal chose me. I'm also one of the oldest staff members. We have a very, very young staff. So that's also a little shocking, but it was true. She said, Hey, you know, would you have any health concerns when it comes to taking the temperatures for students as they come in the building and for the entire staff? And I told her, no, I felt fine about it. Um, but because I'm a music teacher in my class, there are cycles in and out six classes of kids per day. And these are not half classes. I know some places around the country are doing smaller classes. This is up to 28 kids at a time in my room. It's a lot. It's a lot of humans, right? The only thing that's really changed for me is I do get a 10 minute cleaning period between classes, an extra 10 minutes, because I do have to spray down. I'm required to spray every desk after the kids leave. And I am not allowed to sing. <laughs> and I'm a music teacher, so there's no singing allowed at all in my school system. And as an employee, I'm not here to say a single thing about that. That's just a fact. But there's no singing. So that has changed my class a little bit. But for the most part, I am in a room with six full classes of kids coming in and out. And we have had some positive cases. I, as far as I know, I have not had, I feel good, but I also haven't been tested. So as far as I know, I have not had it. Yeah, Dana was, Dana was asking the same question I was about to ask. Are you allowed to hum? Is humming proof? proof, proof? <laughs> I actually specifically sent an email to the district, and the answer was yes, I am allowed to hum. Oh, that's good. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Life is good. <laughs> well, Kelly, I'll tell you what. It's been an hour. This has gone by so quick. I've got to unfortunately run. i got to take my kid to his little ninja flipster gymnastics class in a few minutes. So i gotta, I got to run. Oh. Um, thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to share? Where can people find you? Tell us about the shirts, where they get the shirts, your channel, whatever else you want to okay. focus on. Cannot, you cannot get the shirts right now. Ooh. I just sold them very briefly. Uh, I may do it again someday. I don't know. I, I don't really like selling anything, frankly, but sometimes people ask and, and I'll do it. But um, on YouTube, if you just type in my zero carb life, I'm there and I'm on Instagram, Kelly underscore Hogan 91. And I'm there every day, sometimes being very silly. I, I really, my main goal, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist. And there are a lot of things that I cannot answer for people. But what I can do is eat meat and show that I feel great and show easy, hopefully affordable, fun ways that you can be a carnivore in the real world. And I've just, that's my place. I think that's where I lie. I may not be able to bring all of the science behind everything, but I hope I at least provide a space where people can see that there are other people living this way. Um, and that's mostly what I do on Instagram. And then on Facebook, I help out at zeroing in on health as time allows, which is not as much lately, but that's where I am. Well, Kelly, thanks for being such a wonderful and positive, vibrant example uh, of people doing this. You're, you're, you're a great ambassador and I'm very proud to know you. And, and like I said, uh -huh. you were one of the, the, the people that, 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 gave me the courage to do this as well. So keep doing what you're doing. And uh, thank, thank you, you so much and have a great rest of your weekend and uh, look forward to talking to you again, okay? Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Baker. You are awesome. Thanks okay, you guys. guys, thank you for coming. Bye. All right, everybody, take care guys, I gotta run. See Bye. you tomorrow. Hey, you guys, make sure you come tomorrow. We got a good one tomorrow, I'm looking forward to it, okay? Take care guys, bye-bye.